Howdy, folks. Season 1, Episode 7 of Scrolling with Charlie Midday Show. And uh, well, I, th I thought we were going to have a full panel today because we haven't been able to do that for a while. And I thought, oh, they're, they're going to come running back, but they probably actually have lives and are out there having a Saturday. Uh, unless it's raining. <laughs> Okay, since there's only three of us, y'all can all three unmute yourselves unless you get, unless you got background noise. Uh, I'll just start out with the roll call, and this is really this show is really dependent on the Q and A because that's <laughs> that's how many shows we've done. We're running out of topics, but I got a couple we can throw in there. But I'm gonna start with roll call. On my far left, we have Gary Griffith. So we'll start with you, sir. Where can people find you? Give me your address, your blood type, your Anything if they want to talk to you? Uh, you can uh, find me on Facebook. Um, I've also got a, a YouTube channel. I've only got a, a couple of videos on there because I started into making stuff with pallet wood. Uh, I've been scrolling uh, a couple of years, and I have a uh, Excalibur 16 uh, saw that I use. 10-4, would you like to spell your name in case anybody wants to look you up? Yeah, the uh, first name is G A R Y. Uh, my last name is G R I F F I T T S. My uh, God, thank you very much, sir. Uh, and if I can remember, we'll get everybody to post their social media links in uh, in the comment section after this video has been uploaded. Mark Sherman, our backup co-host. Hi, how you doing? See, always a bridesmaid, never a bride. Up. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, Mark, tell them about all about you where they can locate you. Hi, my name is Mark Sherman. I'm in Bellevue, Nebraska. Uh, I got a Facebook page, uh, Mark Sherman, and also Sherman Scroll Works is where I advertise my uh, scroll saw art that I do. Um, I scroll with a 30 inch Excalibur. I'm currently working on a very big Eagle and Tarja project. Well, it's not big compared to like what you see Kathy Wise doing, but it's pretty big for me. Nice evil project, so um, go ahead and look me up. Uh, I don't have any videos to, to share, but um, I'll get there someday. Yeah, come on, Mark. You've been in this, this field long enough, you got to be in the YouTube world. By the way, your name is going to run across your eyeballs. you got uh, your... Uh, I'm hiding my hard hat head, so I just got off work. So. <laughs> no, you, okay, he, he wore a hard hat, so excuse his hair. My, I'm wearing a cap, but I know bad hair days, so does Mark. Speaking of Mark, Mark Stallings is in misery, but besides that, Mark, tell everybody about you. <laughs> hey, Mark Stallings here, Spiritual Splinters Wood Shop. Um, I've been scrolling now for about seven or eight months. Um, I can be found on Spiritual Splinters Wood Shop on Facebook. I also have Spiritual Splinters Wood Shop on YouTube. Um, I don't have bad hair days because I have no hair. That's the biggest advantage to being bald. Um, so, um, but other than that, um, right now I'm doing a 30 days, 30 crosses and 30 days challenge to myself. And mainly what that is, is to not only spread the word, but it's also to inspire people to get off their lazy butts off their couch and get out and shop and do something. Okay, this, okay. This has motivated me to, to get out there daily, whether I want to or not. So That's good. Uh, by the way, Mark, can you ooch a little bit to your left? There's a big old bright, bright, bright something. There's yeah, there window. you go. Yeah, window. No, we, need your, we need your head to cover that sun. <laughs> I mean, I, I saw the light, and we all witnessed it on, on Trolling with Charlie. We all <laughs> saw the light. But Okay. <laughs> now, <laughs> my comedy career has just ended as if it ever started. I am Charles Daring. Website is woodenvisions.com. Uh, on Facebook, I'm the Charles Daring, and I think the same on Instagram. On YouTube, I'm Charles Daring Scroll, and that's where you'll see this video unless it's been embedded somewhere. We do not have a full panel, so good God, we're going to struggle on topics. <laughs> Q&A, we could use y'all. There's five viewers that dropped drop to four right as I said that. If you have any questions, comments, anything besides cutting me down, <laughs> We get enough of that. Uh, throw, throw it out there, and, and if you don't know how to use the Q&A, uh, I believe on your screen up in here somewhere you'll see a what looks like the side of a Rubik's Cube. I always look at the screen instead of the camera. And you just click on that, and it should open up the Q&A section. Oh, God, okay. 
Here we go, five viewers and no topics. Let me go to the suggestions we had a while back. Let's talk about crap shows. I love looking at organized. It happens once in a while. We're trying to get Mark Stallings to keep his head still so we're not blinded. Anyway, uh, Mark, neither one of y'all have to stay uh, muted unless unless uh, unless you got children running around and wives cussing at you and stuff. <laughs> yeah, already. <clears throat> so, uh, okay, we'll just go down the line since none of the Q and A people love me enough to ask a question or comment. Thanks. Kidding. Yeah, we get a slight echo off of Gary, but it's not annoying enough to mute him. So. Gary, uh, do you have any tips and tricks at craft shows that works for you or particular items that sell best? I know it depends on the area you live in and the market, but this and that, but I'll let you go on from there. Uh, I haven't done any craft shows yet. I have uh, looked at them and visited them. Um, the ones that I have seen, there's only been maybe one or two people there. Um, you know, I, I don't, I mean, from what I've heard with craft shows, uh, they do say a lot of your smaller items do sell best, uh, but I mean, I've thought about trying to do the shows, but out of, a lot of the booth rentals is what really gets me. Some of them are upwards of 150 a day. If you do a two-day show, you know that's that's a $300 booth mm -hmm. rental for the weekend, and you got to be able to make your booth rental and then start trying to make a profit. So the, the craft shows I haven't really gotten into yet, but I hope to maybe eventually try one or two of them and, and see how it goes. I appreciate that. Uh, but that, that's the problem with those. It, okay. I'll, if anybody's been watching for any length of time, they know I'm known for being broke. <laughs> I also have a panic attack, which is why I missed a few shows, but part of that is agoraphobia, which is a fear of public. So that plays into it. But these gigantic booth fees, yeah, you're. I, I cannot afford to spend three hundred dollars on a maybe. I gotta know that my stuff is gonna sell. But my problem is, is I do all this intricate detail crap, and people want garage sale prices at most craft shows. So that's on me yeah. to come up with a, a, a smaller, simpler things that I can charge less for. We had a fellow named Dave. I missed his last name. Come came in. Uh, Dave, do you have a camera or a microphone? He's muted. Uh, if you can see that you are muted, uh, if, in case you are able to unmute yourself, all you have to do is go to the top of your screen, a little black bar will pop up, you click on the microphone and that will unmute you. And I don't know what to tell you about your camera. If you cannot talk to us or get on camera, slide all the way over to the left with your icon or your your mouse and you will see a bunch of icons pop out Hit the top one that's the chat section you would type in anything there no cam or mic okay so so you found the chat section so uh, while I'm going down the line go ahead and uh, type in the chat section where you're from and how long you've been scrolling where people can find you and I will read that to the viewers okay right and then we'll be talking about craft shows in the meantime Mark Sherman have you ever done craft shows if so what worked what didn't work uh, what's all best in your area, and all that other, other sort of stuff. And you viewers, you better be throwing some questions and answers and comments. By God, we depend on y'all. All right. Um, I've only done, well, I've been scrolling since the early 90s or so, but I and I took a big hiatus as far as doing craft shows. I actually scrolled for about 10 years or so while I was in the military. Um, recently, I've done about three of them, and... Uh, they were pretty small time craft shows. They were like maybe twenty bucks or so for the booth cost, so it wasn't that big of a deal. So booth rental or whatever wasn't that big of a thing for me. Um, I did very well at these craft shows, and it, I suppose a lot of it was seasonal. So because um, they were kind of in the November December time frame, and the type of stuff that I had was a lot of um, Christmas ornaments. Um, well, a big thing for me was a very small uh, piece from Steve Good. It's for a, it's a mini nativity scene that did very well for me. Um, I didn't expect it to be very popular, but it, it it was very much so. You know, I ended up making probably about at least twenty or so. I only had about maybe three to begin with, and but I got kept on getting orders for more from people that saw it. So, um. I think, um, like you were saying, it's it's better to go into craft shows expecting to to sell your small stuff than hoping to 
sell your big items. Um, and that's that's a hard thing, I'm sure, for Charlie because yeah, your stuff is, is pretty large and you spend a lot of time on it. So you have to have the right customer for your for your projects. I appreciate that. Yeah, again, that's on me because <clears throat> I think in the event that I don't sell, the excitement for me in scrolling is to challenge myself and try to outdo the last one. It doesn't always happen, but I think <laughs> that's why I have so few simple projects because I want I'm wanting to impress myself if that makes any sense. And, oh, it does. It does. Uh, I hope that doesn't sound arrogant, but uh, uh, yeah. But the agoraphobic side of my disability uh, has prevented some of that. But those boothies and and uh, okay, as an example, and I will get to you, Mark Stallings. I I promise. <laughs> um, I've done two or three shows. I think out of all those shows, I've sold one eight by ten. That was back when I did eight by tens. Um, another time I did that thing where you sit on the side of the road hoping people will stop. I sat there for eight hours. One little old man hobbled over, looked around, said, oh, you do woodwork, and then he walked away. <laughs> I was thinking, really? <laughs> no, actually, as far as paper mache, but thank you for stopping. Appreciate that. Uh, Char Charles. Yes, sir. Uh, Dave Sherman says that he's from Lam Lompoc, California. He's been scrolling uh -huh. scrolling for about 10 years. He's done one craft show that was local for a $20 booth fee and sold about $100 worth of stuff. Wow. Thank you for that. I'm glad you're monitoring that because I'm monitoring the empty Q&A. Six viewers, just saying. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Uh, and... Uh, uh, for the guy whose name you just mentioned that I forgot. I believe it was Dave, yes. Sorry, Dave. Dave's not here. <laughs> okay, uh, Mark Stallings, uh, I know you haven't been scrolling terribly long, but uh, have, have you mentioned uh, or tried craft shows or had any luck with them? And I know you're you're currently doing the cross thing, but that also tends to be a good seller in any market, but uh, I'll let you answer all that. Yeah, I uh, have a craft show that's actually coming up in November. But it's one of them craft shows that last year they had 40 vendors on the waiting list to get in on it. And wow. so you want to get in early on it. It's a $65 booth rental for two days. Um, and one of the ladies I go to church with was telling me about it. She's a member of the club that puts it on. Uh, last year they had zero people doing what I do. The closest thing they had was a wood burner, and well, so deal. it's going to kind of, you know. So I'm going to get in on that one, and uh, of course there'll be several of the crosses there um, that I'm doing. But I'm also doing some of the veteran plaques that uh, uh, Sheila Landry and Keith Fenton gave out to veterans. I'm doing some of them, and I've got a couple more worth. Uh, a lot of it is finding your finding what sells in your market, you know. I mean, um, you know, and from the way it sounds, pretty much anything I take in there is unique. Yeah, you know, and while while I kind of got it captive here for a second, uh, thank you, Charlie, for the pattern that you did of my mother. Oh, you're welcome. And that was cut completely with straight blades. Very good. Uh, I, 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 no, I, I was happy to do that. Uh, we do have one comment in the QS, QSSR. The Q&A, DWSSR, I believe his name is Dan, out of Pennsylvania. I've done this a couple times, and I still can't remember stuff. He said, I think I finally made it here live. I always have a very hard time getting here. Very congratulations on getting in. Now bring all your friends, because we only have seven viewers, and you're the only one commenting, which is not bad. <laughs> I need to shut up on that topic so I don't screw it up. But <clears throat> as far as uh, uh, us talking about markets and what sells and what doesn't, sometimes it, it goes on the state you're in, the what your state is known for, or even state-related things. Uh, your county or your little town might be broke, <laughs> like mine. Yeah, um, <laughs> but but it's it's like and I've said this before, you can sell a hundred things for a dollar or one thing for a hundred. My problem is I'm 
I'm doing that one thing for a hundred kind of thing, and I really got to get out of that mold. I know I keep saying that, but uh, uh, and also, and I, I think we can all relate to this even before we got into what we do. Not a lot of people realize the time it takes. You're used to you used to going to like Walmart or some mom and pop store and seeing something that's mass produced, and so they get away with selling it for dirt cheap, and they. They say an intricate cross, and you're selling it for 75 bucks. They're thinking, no. I actually posted for sale a relatively intricate cross, and this lady said, I, I can buy that in a store made out of metal for whatever, 20 bucks. I said, well, all due respect, ma'am, that's probably mass produced and from another country, blah, 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 blah. But it is hard. The field we are in is hard to make money at unless you just found the right niche. Uh, product and uh, the theme of that product, but uh, some areas, Western or Indian stuff, or Native American if you want to be politically correct, other area, almost every area, unless they're full of atheists, uh, like crosses, so that's a good thing, and that goes back to Mark only doing his cross a day for uh, the month of April. Oh God, I'm running out of topics. Uh, I think I think one thing that if you get into craft shows, don't limit yourself to accepting cash only. Yeah. Um, there's no reason why you can't get the little square device that plugs into your your iPod or your Android or whatever to accept credit cards, and it's free. You know, it doesn't cost you anything to get the device, but they charge you a very small little fee for each transaction. But that's that's pennies, which which yeah. probably would turn down in, in sales if if people didn't have cash. So. Yeah. It's, it's like it's well uh, worth it. I think it's like three percent or something like that is what Square charges on each transaction. Which, uh, I mean, I mean on a twenty dollar sale, I mean three percent is going to be what a couple dollars. Which I mean, that's pretty cheap. And a lot of people now, when they go buy stuff, they use their ATM debit cards or credit cards more than carry cash with them and I think you're like Mark said your sales are going to increase if you do have that to take yeah. credit card transactions I've had yeah. to turn away sales because they didn't have cash so now I got the card and it took just weeks or so to get one and get it all activated and stuff and, and it's 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 cheap it's free it's it's worth it, worth it. Um, well, and you also, if you go to Walmart, you can buy the Square Reader, and they charge you like ten bucks. But if you go to Square.com, you can sign up for it for free, and they'll send you a free reader. So, yeah, and I, and I believe there's other organizations out there that do that. I know Square is a very popular one. Uh, I got so many things running through my head. I flat forgot what I was going to say. Eight viewers, come on, give us some questions, comments, answers, anything, <coughs> and. Uh, Dave, you're welcome to chime in in the chat section, and Mr. Griffiths will get with you. Uh, we'll be with you in a moment. We'll have our people get with your people. Uh, what the heck was I going to say? We were talking about the Oh, yeah. That tells you how long it's been since I've been to a show, because if I were ever to go to a show where there's a bunch of vendors, I always made it a point to have cash in my pocket, because back then, you know, the whole square reader thing wasn't real wasn't real popular yet, so it made sense to have money in your pocket to go to these vendors. But, yeah, that being said, having these credit card readers is a good thing to have because if, they, if they're trying to fib to you and just get squarely and trying to get out of, a, out of buying something, they, well, I got a card reader, so what's your next excuse? I, I, I gave it to the office. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so, uh, come on, Q&A. Uh, Seven viewers, uh, if you've ever done a craft show, what worked for you, what uh, uh, objects sold best for you, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'm going to have to go to my... Y'all feel free to jump in anything you want to talk about while I'm looking to see what the next topic people had talked about. Okay. What? Okay. Screw it. I'll just... <laughs> oh, we're organized here. I, okay, here's a question here. Can you read that for me, Gary? I didn't catch it in time, and I'm trying to leave the Q&A open. Uh... Dave Sherwood says he's got a question. The picture that is up for him, I guess his thumbnail, he has seen it for sale on Etsy for 350 Does that sound right? Uh, well, that's about what I would charge. I guess it would depend on if it was an 8x10, you can't get that much. 
But that's why I, that's actually what started me doing bigger things because if you can get more detail in in a bigger pace, then you can justify more money. It does it hasn't worked for me because <laughs> I don't get many sales, but it gets you a lot of compliments. But uh, but that I believe that's a Jeff Zabino design uh, that he's showing, and if if it's a sizable pace, yeah, you can get away with that much or more. He said, by he said it's eleven by fourteen. Yeah. Uh, that's a toss-up because I personally don't have the materials uh, or patience to make a simple picture frame, which is weird because I can spend hours doing this kind of crap. Uh, but that the the more the better you present things, the uh, better odds of them selling as well. But I don't think that price is out of the realm of re real reality. That's what I'm looking for. Dan uh, says if you want to sell, you have to offer what people want to buy. <laughs> Hey, excuse me. Uh, not just what you like to make, and that's where I'm guilty. The things you all make are quality, one of a kind, even custom made. I like to know who made my purchase, maybe even signing it. I actually make my signature part of the cutting. I'll either make my name out of wood, or I'll cut my name from the wood. That's just how I sign it. Because if you know if somebody's out there looking to resell crap, they can sand your name off if it's signed with a ink or whatever. But well, you could also go get those uh, wood burning kits, and if your piece allows the spots, you could wood burn your a name or your symbol into it as well, and that kind of makes it harder to to sand off and remove. Yeah, some people use those uh, uh, brands, but those are little on the pricey side, at least for my broke But uh, Mark, do you have a way that you per you personalize your items, or just? Uh what I do is I, I I just print out my logo that I have on my on my screen here, do it backwards, and I use a, like a wood burner to kind of uh, heat it, you know, from the laser copier to the back of the to the pattern or the to, to the project. But that's not very good on uh, on ornaments, so you have to use like a small pen device, whatever, wood burner to etch in your initials or, or whatever. But for my larger larger projects, I just do the heat transfer from the laser jet toner to the back end of it. So. And it seems to work out really well. And what I found is I, I use um, oil linseed oil for the majority of my projects. And once I use that, it seems to transfer a lot easier to the wood than uh, just plain raw wood without any finish on it whatsoever. So. I did not know that. And anybody interested in what he was just talking about, there's YouTube videos on how to do that where you can use... I don't think you have to necessarily use laser printer, but it's easier yes. because you're reheating the toner. There are there are chemical ways of doing it with other methods, but on, on a laser printer, you're reheating the toner that, that dried on that paper. So you have to print out whatever you're going to be signing it with. You have to print that out backwards. And, uh, Trevor, Car Trevor Carter uh, has a couple videos up in that. Yeah, uh, yeah, Trevor, you, Trevor you Carter. Do, you do have to use a laser jet printer or some sort, an ink jet won't work, but if I'm not mistaken, I really don't think you have to print it backwards on the paper because you're basically just laying it down as you see it, and it should heat transfer over. There's also another process. I don't I don't remember where I saw it at, but she got a some type of – it's not really a glue. It's some type of uh, gel medium, and she put it on the wood – Took the paper, put it, and glued it down. Waited overnight and used a damp rag, and it pulled the paper right off, but left the image that she printed on the wood. I, I forget what gel medium it was that she used, but it, it worked the same way as doing a heat transfer. Could that be a mod mod podge or something like that? It wasn't mod podge. It was like mod podge, but it was some type of gel medium. But then she used the mod podge over the top of it to seal it in. It's Mod Podge is Mod Podge is like a, a, a hard plastic sealer. It it also works good as a glue, but it's a once it dries, it's like a real extremely hard plastic, and it's actually pretty good stuff to use if you want to seal something in. Yeah, a friend of mine uh, named Bobby Riggs, uh, he his niche for quite a while now has been making uh, crosses in general. So uh, Mark Stallings, you may want to look him up if you're running out of cross ideas. Uh, it's spelled R-I-G-G-S is his last name. Uh, but he, he's done quite a few Mod Podge projects, him and his wife both. And you can do that with material if you wanted to have a, a, a theme going on on top of the cross rather than just the design. Uh, 
Uh, so I should have gotten with Bobby Riggs ahead of this. I don't know what he goes by other than Facebook, Bobby Riggs. But we have ten viewers. I know y'all have been to craft shows or have done craft shows or want to do craft shows or know what sells for you and what doesn't. Please feel free to click on the little Rubik's Cube in the top of your corner of uh, your screen and ask us some an uh, answer stuff and, and comment. By God, we're halfway through the show, so we've lived this long. Uh, God, what do I say now? Uh, okay. Okay, let me ask this. What do y'all... I know it sounds like neither one of us have frequented a whole bunch of craft shows, but how do you set up your display to try... Carol, Carol's back with us. Maybe she can hear. Maybe she can't. Maybe she can talk. Maybe she can't. <laughs> Are you able to hear or say anything, Carol? I'm doing sign language. Okay, I don't want to phrase too long, but if you if you can hear us, type in the chat section and all that fancy jazz. Uh, I guess I'll go down the line again. Uh, Gary, uh, did you have a particular setup when you've done? Sh I can't remember who had what answer, so forgive me if I if you say you've never <clears throat> been to a show and I talk to you about it. No, I had, I had never done one, but the ones I've been to, I'll, I'll look at how they have their stuff set up. Um, most craft shows, I think they go by your size, like 10 by 10 or 10 by 20. Now, the ones I've seen, and look how they have their set up, some have tables set up with stuff on it. Uh, some have little uh, pedestal shelves or set up with stuff on it. Some have a, a shelf on a table with pegboard on it to hang some of their stuff on. Uh, I think it all really does depend how you have it set up. Uh, I think if you have a way for them to actually walk through your booth like a, a path, so instead of just walking by and standing, they have to walk around something to see what else you have. The yeah. more time they spend at your booth looking at stuff, I think the more interested in a chance you would have to make a sale and talk to them as well. Because the, the more they're there looking, the more interest they're going to draw. If it's just walk by, I look, and go on, they're not going to stop. They're going to keep moving. But if you can get them to stop and spend time to get their interest drawn, I think you'd have a better luck in sale. Absolutely. And that being said, I'm going to go down the line, but uh, it's also good. It makes the customer feel important if you take the time to not not only greet them. And sometimes it's hard if you do have a bunch of people in your in your booth, but you, you want to interact with them to make I don't know, I'll, I'll say make it seem like you're interested in them because you are genuinely interested in them because they could be a potential sale. But you want to interact with the customers that are in there to make them feel like they're not just a number and a person passing through your booth. Even if they're not interested, they may remember how you treated them and pick up one of your business cards if you happen to have one sitting there or a brochure. And that could help you in the future. Uh, I think that's only happened for me once because I, I overpriced crap. But... <laughs> Uh, Mark, uh, again, I don't remember who said they've been at shows and who they haven't, but did you have a particular setup that worked good for you or that you've seen? Uh, my biggest thing, like I said, I've been working with a lot of Christmas ornaments, so I decorate uh, decorate my table like it was, you know, Christmas. Um, somewhat holiday type festive. Uh, it was just a simple table with um, just a nice tablecloth on it and a probably like a three-foot Christmas tree that I hang the ornaments on. So it gives you a little display of, of what they look like on a tree, you know, the nice wood contrast with the evergreen color, and I think that sells very well. You know, it's a good it's a good selling feature. So that's that's my biggest thing. I haven't gotten into um, having the big, huge displays with the pegboard and the lights and all that good stuff, but <laughs> that's, that's where you get into the, you know, three or $400 shows that you have to get um, – Jury in and stuff, and I haven't done those yet. So they've just been big, small time, like you know, church bazaar type craft shows, or for the band boosters of the local high school that I've been doing. But they've they've made me quite a bit of money, so I just haven't gotten all that that fancy with my displays. So, but at least it's if you display, try to display while you're selling, and how it will be displayed in the home, it'll be helpful. So. Uh, no, we cannot hear you, Carol, by the way. Uh, thank you for oh, she, that, Mark. Uh, she still ahead. can't hear us. She can't hear, hear us either, but I'm trying to get her to go up to her settings on the Hangouts to see to make sure her sound card is set up right for Hangouts. 
Okay, uh, if you don't mind uh, trying to walk her through that in the chat section, and I'll try not to be distracted by it. Uh, uh, Mark Sherman, you were talking about uh, the displays, and the efforts that people make to display will show through whether you realize it or not, because like making a Christmas tree gives them an idea of what it would look like hanging on a Christmas tree. Right. Now, you may not want to use a full-size Christmas tree because that, that will distract from all the little individual ornaments, but even a makeshift Christmas tree, people are getting to see the setting it's going to be in. Uh, and, you know, things like that. I, now, back when I did it, I had one single six-foot table, and I would try to place as many pieces as I could on it and up against it. You know, that's because of limited funds. But uh, Dan, again, in the Q&A section, saying I should try a consignment shop, and I've tried that. And back then I sold a few, but that place went out of business. I think I curse places that I go into because almost every place I've ever sold in is now no longer a business. But that's because they were mom and pop stores, and those are few and far between these days. And don't get me started on that topic, by God. Uh, Mark, Mark Stallings, did you... Uh, okay, let's say, even if you haven't actually done a craft show, what displays... I mean, what kind of displays have you seen, if if not used yourself, that seem to work and pop, bring attention to you? Well, the one that I saw that kind of caught my eye is kind of a trifold. It's got a like a two by two framework on it, pegboard on it. Um, you know, and you can kind of put that in the backside. People can walk around. You can have your table out there with your smaller stuff. Um, you know. Something to kind of make you stand out, but at the same time, you don't want to waste a whole lot of your booth space, you know, on your display. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is the small stuff y'all keep speaking of? I, I don't understand. What What is small stuff? <laughs> this is stuff less than four foot square. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, Dan, Dan Ingerbretson, uh, good to hear from you again, sir. He says, good to see you back, Charlie, and it's good to be back. I don't like paddock tags, uh, and congrats on your new shop. That's another topic, you know, just to tell myself. I recently got a 12 by 32 building. It's one of those rent-to-own things, but I'm tickled to death. But the uh, biggest cost initially is going to be getting power to it. We're looking close to 200 bucks, and I live off 700 a month, but this ain't a sob story, so it's going to be a... I don't know what the heck it's going to take to get that shop going, but that's why you haven't seen any project videos from there yet. A very long extension cord. Yeah. People keep telling me that, but ever since that day it got delivered, we've had torrential rains, if not steady rain, and I'm afraid that there's a hole in that extension cord that I don't know about. It's going to find it in one of those puddles. But uh, th thank you for the, the welcome back, uh, Dan. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, okay, let's... That, that helped me segue into another topic. Uh, I know we've covered shops before, but, uh, okay, Gary, what changes would you like to make to your shop to, for it to be ideal? I know last we saw you actually had it in a, in a room of some kind. Is that still the case? Oh, I've got, right now, I put my um, saw inside for this winter just so it was, it was warmer and stuff because I was going through... Uh, quite a bit of propane last year, so I put it inside. But my garage or shop, as I call it, it it's pretty small because the house was built in '45, and of course vehicles then were small, so it's a pretty small area. So my placement of tools and machines and stuff had to be pretty well organized and placed right to get where I need to be. And ideal, I would love to have it bigger. You know, if I could go a couple feet bigger on a wall to extend over, I think it would really make a difference and help. But I think having a, r a bigger area to work in, to be able to have what I need in there, that would be ideal to start with, and then being able to have a dust collection set up would be nice, and, and you know yeah. stuff like that to be more organized. But I think my biggest deal is, is room is where I'd like to have. Absolutely, that's what inspired me to my my. I still say my current shop because I haven't moved into the big one yet, but uh, it's five feet by fifteen feet, and there. You, if there's two people in there, you got to bring in groups just to, <laughs> that's how cluttered it is, but I forgot what my point was because I was trying too hard to be funny. Um, <laughs> crap. Live TV, folks. This is part of your imagination. It's not even TV. It's a video, Charlie. 
Oh, God, I'm just going to move on because, no, I don't know, but for anybody that's remotely interested uh, on my YouTube channel, Charles Deering Scroll, you will see the shop I got and the process of it being brought in and all that. But if you could, if you could have heard sounds while I was getting the shop, you would have heard those like angels singing. Oh, <laughs> I mean, I saw halos and and sunbeams and I I sang Jesus. I, I no, that I, it it seems silly that something like that would be a dream of mine. But I've always I've always struggled financially, and I'm trying not to focus on that too much. But so for something like this to happen, it's it's a uh, I'm elated. I'm, I'm very excited, but I know people. My dad says, "Well, son, you always want things done yesterday." So yes, I'm wanting all the walls closed in and insulated and all that crap. And uh, <laughs> so yeah, but our first thing I gotta do is get power to it, and then I think the next step will be building a little wall just to have an area to do what I'm doing now. So my, my wife's trying to get me out of the house because I smoke in the house, and let's not start lecture me on smoking. Anyway. Um, I'm going to build a little area for that, so that'll be a single wall, and then I'm going to close off the loft so the air conditioner and or heater has less room to try to heat off or heat off, cool off or heat heat up. <laughs> yeah, thank God I'm backwards. John, I sent you a, a link to get in here, Sparky. Why didn't you come in? Yes, and uh, John Schaffner says a larger shop means you get more stuff to fill it. But John Schaffner, I sent you a link to get in here. You by God ought to get the booty in here. Thank you for uh, for the comment. And we have Dan once again. Seems like my shop is ever evolving and I think for any of us uh, that, that, is, that is true, Dan. Uh, what was I talking about before I got easily distracted? I'm not good at organizing either, uh, Dave, but you know, I I I, I pretend to be. <laughs> Mark, were you the last one I went to, Mark Mark Sherman? On No, it was Gary. What the heck were we talking about? Shops. Yeah, shops. <laughs> okay, God. Even I'm not paying attention to the show. That says a lot. Uh, Mark, uh, Mark Sherman, uh, last I saw, I believe you were in a, a little room, weren't you? Were, no, you had a, you you, had, you did a walkthrough, and you had actually a quite a sizable area you were working in. Yeah, I... I, we just, we just, I just went from a house with two cars, and I was sharing my garage with my car, and <laughs> we just um, moved into a new house in, in July, and it has a five-car garage, but two of the stalls are tandem, and I took the two, two, ta two back tandem stalls and walled it off from the rest of the three-car garage, and that's my shop. So it's about 16 by 20 or so around that. I'm not, I don't have the exact dimension. I have it all laid out on my Google SketchUp thing, but. Um, one thing that I would do to my shop right now, or at least if I had the money, is uh, more power. So um, I'm tired of tripping over extension cords uh, and, and popping circuit breakers and, and this and that. So power would be my biggest thing, and then everything else is secondary to power. So if I don't have to have extension cords, I'm, I'll be a happy camper. Um, I can I can handle. You know, using a dust, you know, a shop bag for dust collection and whatever, but power is a necessity and um, heat. So um, right now we we have a, a hot tub and that came with the house sitting in the back and it's right behind the, the shop. So if I can get rid of the hot tub, I have a 220 volt circuit that it's wide open for me to to plug my heater in for. So I'd be happy camper doing that too. So yeah, yeah, power is a big thing. With power comes air conditioning and possibly heat. So. That's the only disadvantage. Well, only disadvantage I can talk about on air of being married. You gotta get permission for some things. <laughs> yeah. uh, but we need more power. Uh, Carol, it sounds like you have audio now. Are you I working? Do. By golly! <laughs> uh, I'm glad you finally got through. Uh, tell everybody about yourself, how they can find you, and if you have a YouTube channel, then tap that. Just whatever you want to talk about. Um. I don't know what to say. Um, <laughs> I've never done this thing before, so <laughs> uh, I probably should have got my got out of my pajamas and some clothes. It's alright. I'm naked from the waist down, so don't worry about it. <laughs> I, I'm kidding. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, don't blow it. It'll hurt the show. <laughs> so, uh, have you ever done craft shows or anything that worked, or you saw things that impressed you, or? 
I, have you I'm two videos? Uh, I, I actually threw a whole mess of things at you. Do, number one, uh, are you on social media where people can find you, and do you have a YouTube channel, and have you done craft shows? Uh, I am on Facebook at USA Laser Pro and Carol Level. Um, I haven't. We have a YouTube channel, but there's like one video on there. <laughs> and we mostly do laser engraving and stuff. That's why I, what I use most of your patterns for is I convert them to vegetable files and use them with my laser. Really? <laughs> Lasers. Yeah, I, I remember the name U.S. Laser Pro. I, I remember you friended me a long time ago, and her last name is spelled L-E-B-L, for those that mm -hmm. want to look her up. And uh, Carol, I'm getting a little bit of echo. It's probably because you're not wearing headphones, so if it's okay when you're not talking, uh, to mute your microphone. If you don't know how to do that, go up to the very top, and you'll see a picture of a microphone. Just click on that, and when I come to you, you can unmute it. <laughs> it is not personal. It's just to keep the... The audio to a, a what we call it. Uh, Dan Ingerbretson says even with the two car garage, there's still not enough room. So I put everything on rolling stands. Also, that way I don't need much dust collection. Much. Uh, thank you for that. I need dust collection, but I call it a broom because that's all I can afford. So. The Charles. I forgot. Yes, sir. Dave Sherwood said he's got a two car garage as his shop. I live in California year round. It's good weather to scroll. And he said uh, his list is too long on stuff that he would like to improve his shop with, and he's not good at organizing. <laughs> All righty. I'm laughing because in the Q&A, <laughs> somebody named uh, Teddy Hartling saying, who is that lady? <laughs> I've never seen Teddy Hartling either, so who is that guy? Uh, she is – she's Carol Level, L-E-B-L. -E she's uh, – does laser stuff, and she's been in the scrolling community for quite a while, I think. I don't know how much actual scroll sawing she does because she, like she mentioned, she's on Facebook under uh, the USA Laser Pro. So I'll ask her that. Thank you for asking Teddy, but who is Teddy? Tell us who you are, Teddy. <laughs> uh, Carol, have you ever done a scroll sawing or is it all lasers? I have a scroll saw. Um, <laughs> I haven't had time to get around to using it because we're usually doing, you know, working. But I've got a huge collection of patterns that someday I'll get back there and, you know, I, I plan on doing it. And I'm gaining a lot of knowledge, you know, from you and everybody else. But uh, so far, this growth ball has not been touched. <laughs> I understand now. My this this could be a debate for some people. Now, I don't have personally have a problem with laser work because as long the only time I have a problem with laser work is if they try to pass it off as scroll saw hand done work. And I think Carol understands that. And I I know she's shaking her head, meaning she doesn't try to pass it off as that. But that, I'm saying that's the only time I have a problem with with laser work. Uh, but the well, best we, way to tell we would me, never do that. Yeah, and, and you don't strike me as that type either. But uh, but if you're looking at, if you're more into it, and I'm not saying this is you, Carol. I'm just throwing this out there. If if you need the income and mass production, uh, a laser will do that for you because it can go a lot faster than a person. So if you're one of these people that could use the income and want to mass produce, which a lot of designers would rather you don't do that. <laughs> Sorry about that. No problem. Uh, uh, there again, uh, it's like CNC routers. You know, CNC and lasers and stuff. They have their place. The only time I ever have a problem with either one of them is if they're passed off as hand done. And and majority of people are honorable and won't do that. But if you're looking to make money off of it more so than the passion of doing it, then yes, lasers and CNCs, in my opinion, are the way to go. And, there's quite a big market for uh, laser stuff because you can laser engrave, laser cut, uh, all kind of stuff, and that that totally threw me off the topic of where I was. So was anybody paying attention to me and tell me where I left off before the laser talk? <laughs> I'm I'm really organized here. I, I believe we covered everybody. I was, go ahead, uh, Carol. 
No, I, I was just going to say we use our laser mainly to make braille, braille signs. Ah. But, you know, I'm, I just, I love scroll sawing. I, I just love the art of it. Yeah, there's definitely, uh, there again, I, I, I love the art, art side of it too, and I, that's because I, I'm constantly trying to one-up myself, but that being said, I did this thing and that this project became a big pain in my butt because times like this, okay, I hate the amount of detail I put in things because it takes me forever, but when I'm done, I'm proud of it. That's the plus side, but my God, if you, uh, that's why I need to start coming out with simpler designs or simplifying my old ones, which I talked about doing, because even if somebody's good at scroll sawing, some people don't want to spend more than a few hours on a certain project. So that's why I, I am admitting that I need to do simpler designs or simplify the ones I already got. Now this particular one was a, co a commission piece, even though it was a gift, he, he picked it. So that's why I did something that would be otherwise copyrighted. Because it was a private thing between me and another guy, and he's a friend of mine, so I figured what the heck. Uh, let's let's jump right into that. Uh, that was a good segue into a topic I'll pretend I already had lined up. Gary, <laughs> have you ever? <laughs> God, I'm organized. Have you ever uh, been asked to do something that would otherwise be copyrighted? Me personally, people say, "Well, copyright infringement is copyright infringement," but the way I say it is if. Uh, a single person is walking up to you saying, hey, can you make this for me? As long as you don't try to pass yourself off as a representative of the organization or whatever, that's just my opinion. I'm not saying listen to me and get in trouble and then come back and say, well, Charlie said I can do that. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it's, it's a risk you take. But, I mean, I mean, have you ever made anything that would be otherwise be copyright nabbed if it was out there? Uh, well... I've made uh, my own pattern. It was uh, Dell Senior Number Three, and had his uh, birth and death date. But I made it strictly for me to have as myself. Um, if somebody does want something like that, I usually tell them and, and give them a heads up ahead of time and a warning that I tell them. Now, this I'm making is copyrighted. I cannot really technically make it and sell it, but because you're just a one person, I can make it for you. But I do tell them, you know, if you do ever get to the point that you want to sell it off to somebody else or something, I tell them don't mention me because that is copyrighted <laughs> and it can't come back to me. But got, but copyrighted stuff, there's uh, there's fine a fine fine line between it of what you could do to get away with and what you can't do. So it's, it, I mean, it, it's a a touchy subject for a lot of people, but. I see stuff out there that's that's copyrighted all the time, everywhere, and they have yet to be caught. I think it all depends on what stuff you're you're cutting that's copyrighted and how strict they are going to be. Like Harley Davidson, they're pretty strict and notorious for coming after you and Disney and all of them. But yeah. some stuff you may be able to get away with it, but it's not something I would go out and cut a bunch of NASCAR up and post it on Craigslist and try to sell it off. You're just you're advertising yourself for disaster and for them to come after you. The craft shows are the same way. You're you're just asking for a disaster. But if somebody come up and wanted to know, well, can you make something out of Harley Davidson? Then I would say I can, but technically I can't. But don't ever go <laughs> off selling it and saying, hey, look, this is where I got this from. But it's a fine line. It all depends on the person and if I trust them enough that they're going to have it for them only. But stuff like that, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put my name or anything on it to advertise it, so they really couldn't say, "Oh, this is where he is. I want to go find him." Well, there's there's no trace to follow, but it it all depends on the person and what they want. Yeah, it's kind of like a you can call yourself Delta Force Scroll Works. I was never here. This never <laughs> happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna jump in the Q and A, and then I'll come back to you, Mark Stallings. Uh, looks like John Schaffner does not have a camera or a mic. But thank you for being here, John. Uh, his picture's upside down, probably. So. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was on his head earlier. I do have a mic, I believe. Hey. Okay, I'll be right with you, John. Uh, Dave said, if, uh, uh, dang it, I missed it, Gary. He said something about if not putting a name on it. 
Uh, John Hellstrom says not to change the subject. I use Flying Dutchman NS. I forgot what that stood for. New Spiral number three slash zero three off for those that call it that. Spiral blades, which is only 23 inches diameter. Oh, 0.23. <laughs> That'd be a big blade. Uh, diameter. Uh, is that the smallest FD has out there? I'm not sure. On honestly, John. So. Check with either Mike Morlock at MikeSwordShop.com or WoodenTeddyBear.com or WoodenTeddyBearOnline.com and maybe they can answer that better than I could. Uh, William Carson says, where's where's the fun in copy, copying stuff? Original design is so much more fun. I agree, but if you're looking for more variety, I, mean, I, I got no defense. I, I just, that's just who I am. But... Uh, CNCs and 3D printers, also by Willem Cusson, says CNCs and 3D printers are getting more affordable. How about laser cutters? Uh, so I guess that would be a question directed towards uh, Carol. Are, are laser cutters affordable? Don't forget to unmute yourself, Carol. No. <laughs> They're not they affordable. <laughs> she had to give away her first two. She had to give away her first two children to get that. Just saying. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we. The only reason we got one is because we got a job that paid for the laser. Good deal. Excuse my Dr. Pepper break. Uh, Gary, right, you you're looking at at least twelve, thirteen thousand at least. Wow, Gary. Gary, do you want to catch us up on what David's been saying back there? I know a few windows popped up. I couldn't catch them in time. He he says if you don't put a name on it, like Harley, is it still? Copyrighted. If 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 you took their logo and you turn it into a pattern and you cut it, you've just copyrighted infringement of Harley's logo. I mean, even if your name's not on it, you still made a copy of it and you've copyrighted their stuff. I mean, if you don't put a name on it, it just makes them harder to trace you down and who made it. If if, if you show up at a craft show and you've made it and you're standing there and a person comes up and sees it. Uh, Harley's been known to actually pay normal look of people to go to craft shows and find copyrighted infringement of Harley logos. It's you could get in trouble for it, and it's best really not to do it and just stay out of it because I've heard the the fees and and the fines on that stuff is huge. Well, uh, in his defense, he said not their logo, but a bike in general. Even even if even if you copied their bike, like their V rod or their Donna Glide, and it's identifiable that it is a Harley bike that's still copyrighted. Everything they make is copyrighted. Even, even to the sound of the Harley is a copy, trademark, yeah. patented sound. You cannot copy it. Uh, the shape of their engine, the shape of the bike, all that stuff is copyrighted and patented. Everything Harley, their name, everything that that's theirs. Now, if you want to make a Harley bike. You could change up the design of it. Don't put the Harley name on it or logo on it. You can change it up a little bit to get out of it so it's not identifiable as a Harley, but those that know Harley will know that it was a Harley-made item that but was a bike. Yeah, I agree with that. As long as you leave the logo off, uh, just, I'll be right with you, Mark, Mark uh, uh, Stallings. In my personal opinion, yes, it's still copyright infringement, but if you leave the logo off, and it, the, the shield and all that, I think you can get away with it just being a generic motorcycle picture. I'm not sure you have yeah. to change it up all that much, but uh, go ahead, Mark Sullivan, because I haven't let you talk a whole lot. Harley has a copyright on the bar and shield, regardless yeah. of what's inside there. I, you know, I, I mean, I could it. put Mark Stallings in that bar and shield, and that is still um, copyright infringement. They have it even on that bar and shield. Yep. Uh, yeah, uh, that goes into another area. Okay, the top places to watch out for are Disney, Harley Davidson, and any sports franchise. Uh, and comic books. In comic books, yeah. I, uh, I, uh, even the Texas Longhorns logo, it looks like a simple silhouette of a Longhorn's head. They've copyrighted the curvature of those horns. So, I mean... Now, some of these places you can get licensed for some. Some of them are relatively affordable, especially with colleges and stuff. 
but it, you know, it depends on if you think you'll ever make that money back. But before I move on to anybody else, I'm going to jump into the Q and A. Uh, Edgar Natra says that Harley tried to patent the sound, but it failed in court. But I did hear about that, uh, that them trying to copyright the sound. Thank you for that, Edgar, and thank you for watching. Uh, Dan Ingerbretson says, what if you make slight changes on copyrighted logos? That's your own risk to take, I think. Because if you, I think uh, the court will say, well, this looks too much like something else. In other words... I think that was, that was covered before somebody had mentioned that. I think if you change like a percentage of it, you can get past and get away from the copyright because you changed a percentage of what it looks like. So it doesn't exactly look like it. It looks similar. That's how a lot of these knockoff machines are coming about from China, like your four-wheelers and stuff like that. It may look like a Yamaha four-wheeler, but it's not exactly like it. So that's how they're getting away with stuff like that. So if it's not exactly but looks similar, you may get away with it, but there's still that risk that's going to follow with it. Now, this is not a Kawasaki. It's a Sawakaki, okay? <laughs> Uh, Carol said it has to be at least 15% different for it to be out of copyright. And thank you for, for that, Carol, because that's good information to know. Uh, what was I talking about before all this came up? Because I know I had only gotten to Gary and I didn't get to anybody else. It was before the copyright thing. I love it when I when I stay up on what I'm talking about. Uh, it was after how you set up shows. Like that. Um, well, actually, we're in luck <laughs> because it's one o'clock. It's or my time. It's actually been an hour, but we still have nine viewers. If there's anybody on the panel that has a question, comment, or answer regarding anything we've talked about or anything we haven't talked about, just chime in and tell me your name, and I'll put the camera on you. And we can talk about it. By God, I mean, really. Thanks, guys, and go. <laughs> Um, all right, well, we, we made it to another show. Forgive forgive the uh, the randomness of the show. It's, I'll, I'll be the first to tell you, being that this show is the show, the show is girl saw specific. The topics are getting limited because there's only so much you can talk about. Eventually, we have to revisit old topics, and we might lose viewers that way. But uh, we can come up with. A, uh, future ideas and uh, ideas for the future, uh, what we can eventually meld into, <laughs> if it's not scroll slide, because I don't want to stop doing shows because I love doing them. But hopefully we can keep it scrolling for many years to come. Uh, quick announcement for those that didn't see: uh, next week, uh, I've basically been promised next week, probably on the midday show, we will have Carol Rothman. And I was talking to a few people last night that didn't know who that was, but they weren't full-time scrollers. Carol Rothman has a couple books out, and she makes tells you formulas and methods to make these gorgeous, uh, unique-shaped boxes like look like a cupcake, and that's just one example. Shaped boxes, vases made on a scroll saw, all these things. I highly recommend those books, but I'll get into that more when she's here. If you want to look her up, she is on Facebook. Uh, her, her name is spelled C-A-R-O-L-E and then R-O-T-H-M-A-N. And I believe her profile picture has her standing next to an orange and blue Hegner scroll saw. And in the Q&A section we have John Hellstrom says, thanks for the show, Charlie, and thank you, John, for watching, and you're welcome. Uh, uh, Dan says, thanks for the show. Enjoyed it. Sorry I will not make it tonight. Dang it, Dan. I'm, I'm crushed. He's got company. Okay. I understand. We're going to let it go this time, Dan, but I appreciate it. And I want to thank Carol Level, Dave, I forgot his last name. Sherman. Uh, yeah. D Dave Sherman, Gary Griffiths, uh, John Schaffner sort of appeared at, at least spoke once. Sorry, John. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> and then we had uh, Mark, Mark Sherman and Mark Stallings, who was nice to me the whole time. But the minute that camera goes off, you never know. Uh, Stevie, Stevie 406 says, thanks for the show, guys. P.S. You don't need a topic for the show. Just have a general chat, scroll saw related. I agree. But the reason why, and I had talked about doing that once we ran out of topics, because 
you know, you saw the brain parts I had on this show. Imagine when we have no topics at all to discuss. And that's why I was saying it's very Q and A uh, crucial because <laughs> if we don't have a topic going, we have a panel full of people twiddling in their thumbs waiting on a topic to talk about. But I think between all of us, we we can uh, we can come up with something. And there's Mark doing the visual for the uh, twiddling the thumbs. Thank you, Mark, for that. And Mark is not bald; he just outgrew his hair. And uh, Dave says nothing wrong with Q and A, and I agree. I just it wasn't as active today as it usually is, but that's not me slamming the view. Yeah, <laughs> and I've had the camera on Mark Stallings forever. He's he just got his twenty seconds of fame. Um, no, it's very good what Mark Stallings is doing the uh, across the day, and his again his YouTube channel is Spiritual Splinters, and uh. So you can catch what he, I believe he's up to number 17 now, about to do 18. And uh, thank you uh, for your comment, Stevie. So that being said, we're four minutes over. That means we're all rebels here. Y'all can all unmute yourselves. The, the the link to get in this room has been posted in a few places on Elite Scrollers, uh, Scroller Cafe, and Scroll, uh, Scrolling with Charlie. Hangout details group. So if you want to come in this room, we have a few more spots open even after we're done recording. And uh, add your natures. Malice versus lead pipe topic. There's old Ed. He, he, he's our comedian. But Ed, I expect you to come in here by God. Also on my personal profile, I posted a link to get in the room. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We'll have room for two more so that. Uh, you, you all don't even have to wait till the show is over. But anyway, I apologize if this show bored anybody, but we are struggling for topics. But I think we covered a few decent ones. But if you have any feedback, even if you've seen this video years or months later, if I'm still around, then uh, feel free to comment on it. But thank you, Carol, Dave, Gary, John, Mark, and Mark, and me. Thank you, Charlie, for doing this show. We appreciate you. <laughs> anyway, two things. Carol, cover your ears. Uh, well, Edgar at Natchez joined the show right before we're going off. Don't scroll naked. And for the love of God, scroll off. <laughs>